Well, hello, friends. Welcome back to the program. Today, we're going to keep working on the JavaScript JIT. Um, and we're going to return to a test that we used um, in one of the early JIT videos from the Kraken benchmark, which is the Kraken AIA star test. And let me just show you where we're at right now with the bytecode interpreter. So if we don't enable the JIT, this is how long it takes to run the test. 7.3 something seconds. Uh, now let's enable the JIT and we should hopefully see a much, much better time. Right, 2.3 seconds. So um, we've made great progress on the JIT. It's it's now like a lot faster than the bytecode interpreter for a lot of um, benchmarks and, and various tests, but um, there's still a lot of performance left to be had. So I thought today, uh, let's try to squeeze this test and like profile it, figure out what's missing, like what could we do fast paths for in the JIT to make this test just as fast as we can with the current architecture. And um, we start by making a profile, of course. So um, we'll grab this. And uh, as I understand it, this test is the A star um, path finding algorithm, essentially. So it sets up like uh, a grid and then uh, it searches through the grid using A star. And it's one of the Kraken tests, but I think a year ago we took 18, 19 seconds to run the test or something like that. And the fact that we got down to seven with the bytecode architecture is better than 1819, but uh, we're obviously obviously doing a lot better with JIT. So today I would like to find out how much better could we do. Uh, and I'm not going to profile the whole test. I'll just stop here after a while and we'll see what's going on. So if we look in call grind or kcache grind rather, uh, we can see what stands out. Da 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 da. So we're spending maybe 30% of runtime in JIT machine code already. Very positive, but um, obviously in the ideal scenario, we're spending 100% of the time in like a JavaScript bound test, we're spending 100% of the time in JITed code so that we're running like optimally fast given our architecture. But um, we can see here that we have to call out to C++ for some stuff, in particular, loosely equals. So if we filter here by CXX, we can see which C++ helpers we are calling out to from jittered code. Uh, so we're calling out to loosely equals and get by ID, put by ID, set variable, although now the percentages are starting to get pretty small here. So loosely equals is incredibly heavy. Um, and loosely equals is the equal equal operator. So um, loosely equal, hello. Um, this is the equal equal operator. And then we have strict equals, which is equal equal equal. So this one is the stricter version. And this one is the sloppy JavaScripty one that everybody knows and loves. But it seems like loosely equal just um, delegates the work to strictly equals. At least, seems like in all cases here, basically. Because you look, we have like 13 million calls. And all of them end up down here in the same value non-number. So um, it should definitely be possible to, to make a fast path for equality checking. Like equality checking two values in JavaScript, that's such a common thing. We should definitely have fast paths for that, for like the common cases at least. So let's see. Let's um, let's print out what we're actually comparing, so we can see. Loosely equals. Um, I'm gonna make the debug output slightly nicer, like like that, and then we'll see what we are comparing here. Okay, comparing a lot of objects to other objects. 
All right. Why are we doing that? So if I search for equal equal, that's a strict equals right there. Okay, here are two loose equals. Uh, these are also loose equals. Got a bunch of them. I suspect it's probably going to be one of these. Pause sounds like something that uh, is an object, right? So pause is an X and a Y value. And then we're doing like comparing these to each other. So you're comparing two values or two objects. And object compare in JavaScript is just an identity compare. So it's just like comparing two pointers, which could be incredibly fast if we uh, allowed it to. So I think currently we generate, I mean, we use a macro to generate the code for uh, compile loosely equals. So we have to take it out of the fast path. Um, it's it's a common binary op without a fast path. So let's just remove this one here. Loosely equals, and we should do all of the all of these should get fast paths eventually. But for now, let's just um, focus on the one that we know is being used. So then we'll say like, I mean, now I just have to do what the macro would have done. So loosely equals. And then instead of snake case name, it's supposed to be loosely equals. Okay, and almost loosely equals. Cool. Next step is um, to verify that this still works. So Let's just double check that we didn't screw it up. Okay, yeah, everything still runs about the same. And I wouldn't expect anything weird from this. We're just doing this manually instead of letting the macro do the work. So um, the fast path for this, I guess, we should look at what the C++ version does. So it would call is loosely equal. Um, is loosely equal uh, if the same type for equality. Okay, so if they have the same type, then we call is strictly equal. Sure. Wait, and same type means that um, they have the same tag or they are both numbers? Sure. So um, if they are the same type, then we do a strict compare. Okay, and then now we know that both sides are the same type. So if it's an, if they're numbers, then we do this. Otherwise, same value non-number, which checks for big int, string, uh, and then just does a value compare, like a bitwise compare of the 64-bit value. Okay. So this is not that much stuff. Um, but in our case, let's just do a fast path for the case that we are thinking about right now, just to see what this gets us. We don't have to write out the full fast path for all of those cases that we had here, like big int, string, and so on. Um, so we load these up, and then we want to check if they're both objects. So I guess we can, um, let's check the tags of both. The check if both sides are objects. Actually, we have a helper for that uh, branch if object. Um, we don't have branch of both objects, but we have branch of object, which means that we can nest those bad boys like that. And if we get here, um, then we can just compare them. So 
Uh, we need a label for the true case and the false case. And then we need to be able to jump to the end also. Yeah, so let's see. If we get here, we have two objects. We can just do an identity compare. So M assembler jump if um, if they are equal to each other, that's the true case. Actually, I guess I don't need to have two labels. I can just have one case, and then this here becomes the false case. So I load up GPR zero with um, the constant value false and then store that in the accumulator, right? And then here comes the um, jump to the end, otherwise the true case, where we store the constant value true, and then put that in the accumulator and jump to the end. All right, so that is our fast path if both sides are objects. Let's see how much faster would that be? Okay, it's like 2.15 versus 2.35, basically. It's not uh, not as impressive as I was expecting, but but still, it's like 10% uh, less or something. So it's a, it's a good start. Let's see if we covered all the cases, though. Like, let's log here. Um, make sure that we're not hitting some other case now. So it doesn't print anything. Um, let me just print some other thing, like, I don't know, imaging, desaturate. You're not doing any loose. Audio beat detection, how about you? Okay, yeah, yeah. So these are other fast paths that we could do, but right now we're just caring about A star, AI A star. So, um, with this information in mind, let's do a test JS, verify that we didn't screw anything major up. Okay, it's really good. I think we don't have many remaining uh, bytecode instructions to implement in the JIT. Schedule jump is one of them, but we don't have to think about that right now. We just have to make a commit. So JS make um, uh, the JS JIT and fast path for loosely loose equality check between two objects. Um, there are more fast paths to be added here, starting with this one since it's heavy on Kraken A star. JS. Ah, my precious smiley. Okay. So now let's bow grind again. And we can see what the profile looks like with, um, hopefully with loosely equals eliminated. And I learned this Thing that you can run call grind control dash e and it shows you how many events you've captured so far in the running uh, running call grind so that's kind of nice because I like to have at least five billion events um, just to I don't know why five billion is just a random number that I like just so that you have some meat in the profile and you don't just um, you don't just end up looking at uh, time spent in the parser because um, a lot of these JavaScript benchmarks, they start out by parsing the whole script and then they start running some setup code and then eventually they get into the big um, meaty main loop of the program. And I want to make sure that I don't just profile that startup part because it's less interesting than the whole thing. Uh, now we've got plenty. So 13, 14 million events should be very, 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 very much to look at. Okay. So loosely equals is gone completely. Jan, just a JIT. We're compiling three instances of that instruction. That's it. Good. Okay, so 
internal get, sure. Get by ID uh, looks very, very heavy. So this is a property access. Uh, array. It's array property access. Checking the size of an array. Wait. Hmm. Yes, yeah, so we have like 21 million property accesses on array. Um, but we, we're supposed to already have fast paths for array access. So something is not going right here because, uh, somebody added get by value fast paths for uh, array access with index. If the index is, a uh, in 32, I forget who added it. So let me just double check. It was Iliad SH also known as a big pickle, I think. Yeah, here, <laughs> a big pickle. Um... All right, so let's see. Um, bum, 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 bum. So why doesn't it work? Oh, because it get by ID, right? So get by ID is um, get by ID is o dot foo, whereas get by value is o bracket foo. So uh, we are in get by ID is what we're doing. So this is just get by value has fast paths. So what's going wrong in get by ID then? Um, get by ID. I guess we can print out the properties that are being accessed. So we can see. Okay. Array dot length, and then like the vast majority of accesses are array dot length, and then you have like. A couple, a couple other ones hiding there, like iswall, find graph node, push, but then back to length again. Okay. Um, but that should be cached though, because we, I implemented caching for get by ID so that uh, we have a monomorphic inline cache for own properties. So once you the first time you access an own property of a JavaScript object, we remember the property offset of that object. And then on subsequent accesses, we reuse the offset without doing a lookup. And all that happens in machine code. But we're here, so we're not in machine code, which means that something went wrong with the cache, which means that we should go and... I guess we should go look at array. Um internal get own property uh -huh. okay so it has special handling for length because because array length is magical right because array length uh right array length has this weird behavior where uh, if you make an array and then you say like a dot length is four, then it magically gains uh, elements zero, one, two, and three, right? Um, isn't that how it works? Yeah, it, it gains these four uh, properties magically. And likewise, when you query the length it um the length value the length property value reflects the number of elements in the array and the way we implemented that is by just overriding this um internal get own property mechanism and just like oh if you're asking for the length property then let us just compute that for you on the fly give you a property descriptor here and that has all the right values otherwise we fall back to regular object internal get own property and this probably prevents the caching because Length doesn't have a property offset, which is what we would be able to cache if we had an offset. But because we're just synthesizing this property on the fly, uh, we're not assigning a property offset to the property descriptor, which would have gone here. But we're just creating one without an offset. 
which makes it uncacheable, which means that we can't stay in machine code for the get by ID, which means that we end up in the slow path. Okay. So I think, I think we had this exact same problem in JavaScript core, like 11 years ago or something. I forget exactly when that was, but, um, yeah, we had the same, same issue basically. And the solution was, I think just to essentially like do a fast path for a rate at length in machine code, because array dot length is a super common property to access in scripts. And so it's kind of makes sense to, to, um, it's okay to have a special case for it because it's so common. So what would we do exactly? I guess in the, um, we're here in the, well, we're trying to figure out if we can do a fast path where we have a cached property offset. So we're in the branch of object. So we know we have an object. I guess here, um, well, since it's array dot length, we know that we know statically that we are accessing the length property. So we can actually check that here. So we don't have to emit this special case for anything other than who hmm dot length. So oh, op dot um, property. We have to get the string from the executable. Um, get identifier op property equal equal um, length. Okay, so if it is length, then I want to do all of these shenanigans here. Or actually, no, I don't need to do all this because uh, property key is string. We know that statically, and we know it's length. So then we just need to do this part. But since it's a get by ID, we're only interested in the value. So we don't need to create a whole property descriptor. Like we don't need all this gunk right here. So we just need the value actually, which is just the index properties array like size. Um, so we get the index properties of the object and the array like size from there, which comes from the underlying storage. Okay. I bet you um, array like size. Yeah, yeah, we already have some code for this in get by value. That's the fast path that get by, uh, not get by, uh, that a big pickle added. So we have code here for getting to that storage. Let's see. So. Um, but we need to know that it's, we need to know that it's an object that has a magical length property. Otherwise we shouldn't be doing this. And the only one who has that is array, but we have no way of knowing that something is an array other than by making a virtual call or doing a dynamic cast, neither of which I want to do in jitted code. So what if we just add like um, to the protected flags here? What if we just do something like this? Has magical length property. Actually, let's see if that grows object. So object before my change is how large it is, 64 bytes. After this change, it is 64 bytes. Okay, that's good. Um, and then we also need to store the offset of this thing. So like static flat better has meh. Okay, so then the JIT can go and fetch this flag. And then we just have to make sure we set it in the array constructor. Okay. So that should be fine. And then our little fast path that we were working on here has to check that first of all. So um, if object has um, has magical um, length property, um, 
bah, 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 go to let's see no we don't want to go to the slow case we just want to go to the normal fast path no magical length property Oops. because if we don't have a magical length property we can just do length like we normally would for any other property Okay. But if we do have one, so first we want to load eight bits from um, the object is in GPR zero. Sure. Has magical length property offset. Um, oh, it's a protected member. Oh, my bad. I guess I have to make that public. Okay, so we load 8 bits, and then we want to branch. Now, M assembler jump if GPR1 is equal to uh, 0, I guess, then jump to no magical length property case. Cool. Now, we have to fetch that thing, which means doing... Um, doing this business so get index properties array like size so I think get by value is getting the array like size in order to bounce check so let's see we are here getting the index property storage bailing on a null checking that it's a simple storage otherwise I don't know that we can handle otherwise and then here we're fetching out the array like size and then doing some stuff that we don't care about. Yeah, so they're just using it for a balance check here and get by value. Um, get by ID. Let's put here a note fast path for array dot length, which uh, is magical which magically reflects the array-like size of its wrapper of the array objects property storage. All right. Sure. Um. Okay, so now we copy in this stuff. So we have the object in GPR zero, and now we're overwriting that, but I guess it's okay to overwrite it. We don't need the object. We just need to get to the array size. So let's see. If we don't have storage, we go to slow case, which makes sense because we know that there's a magical length property on the object, but for whatever reason, it doesn't have storage. So bail to slow case, sure. Um, okay, and then if GPR zero is not simple storage, bail to slow case as well. It's probably okay. What, um, Let's see, what if storage is not simple? So like, what if we have a generic index property storage? How do we get the array like size? It's just like at a different offset. Offset 16 bytes, offset 16. They're actually at the same offset in simple property storage and generic property storage. Uh, but even so, Let's only care about simple storage right now. Fix me. Do. Or if you have an array with generic property storage, I don't know. Let's not think about that case. Simple property storage is what you're going to have 101% um, of the time right now. 99%. Whatever. Um, okay, so here, this we copied from the get by val fast path. It's doing something with registers we haven't been using, so let's ignore that. And then 
what they wanted to do was a bounce check. We just want to take the array like size and put it in the accumulator. So we load that into GPR1 and then store accumulator GPR1. And then we can actually jump to the end, I think. Because we're basically done here. Yeah. Let's see if we got this right. This would be really nice if we can take this path for a rate of length. This is a lot tighter than doing the full property lookup, followed by the virtual dispatch to an internal get on property on array, followed by creating a property descriptor, uh, returning that whole thing, picking it apart again, getting the value out. Um, okay, well, something didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I am not familiar with this exception. No end question mark. Um, okay, so we probably broke something. Um, probably broke a lot of things. Sure. Okay, not to worry. We'll figure this out. So um, let's make a simple test. So array JS. So we'll make an array and then we'll say we loop three times console.log a a push five and then what happens when we run that um that looks fine but i actually wanted to log a dot length Uh, okay, so it starts out with zero, that's good, but then things get weird. Really weird, okay. Um, hmm. Oh, right. Um, I can't just take this number and just return it. I have to actually um, tag it to say that this is an N32. So let's do that. Hmm, we'll do that right here. So sh we have to sh or in the shifted in 32 tag, which this is what's going to allow um, allow us to use it in JavaScript. So or it in with GPR one, sure. And then store that out, jump to the end. Okay, so that looks better. I guess I could have. Yes, that's cool. It's JS. Seems like no major incidents. Some bytecodes we don't support. Sure. Look at that time. Oh. That is a low number. Mm. 870 milliseconds. Now we're talking, dude. Holy moly. Okay. Um... That is a lot faster than we were before. <laughs> um, this is really cool. Okay, let's um, yeah, let's let's um, commit here. So let's say libjs jit and fast path for array dot length. Oops. Uh -huh. Oh, did I lose what I typed? Add fast path for get by ID with array dot length by ID of. 
uh, array that length is magical since it has to reflect the number of elements in the underlying property storage and the object property storage. We now handle it especially in uh, jitted code, giving us a massive speed up on Kraken AI, a star JS, and probably many other things as well. Uh, that is just a monstrous speed up from 2.15 seconds to 0.87. Uh, that's so cool. Okay, so if we profile here, I wonder what do we even have left at this point? Um, because before we had the we had the loose loosely equals and we had um, array that length and I mean we're still obviously we're still doing like. 0.87 seconds worth of something so there's still still stuff happening but um, if we test this with like JavaScript core for example um, oh right they don't have console.log but I think they have print in JSC so we can change that and we can see that they run in about 0.1 seconds um, or they report 75 milliseconds, but, oh, look at that. <laughs> we actually finished. So we captured the whole thing. That's cool. Um, yeah, so 0.1 seconds is how long the whole test takes in JavaScript core versus 0.87 for us. So we're still like eight times, eight point something times slower than JavaScript core, but um, JavaScript core is a four tier optimizing compiler with many, many layers and decades of optimization uh, work by thousands of man hours. So uh, I don't feel bad about being 8x away from, from that. Um, so let's, let's take a look at where we are here. Uh, okay, so, so this pops out right here, 85.7% self time in generated jitted code that's really good that means that we're spending less than 15 percent of runtime in this test in um, c plus plus and the majority of execution time now happens in machine code which is fantastic uh, we do still do some stuff in c plus plus we do um, call frame setups that's something that we don't know how to do in jit code because our call frames are really awkward. Um, in the future, it would be definitely be cool to be able to do like um, like inner procedural stuff in the JIT, but there's a lot of things that need to happen before we can can um, make JIT code call each other. And um, in the future, if you want to do inlining, like there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen before we can do stuff like that. But we have calls in C++, we have set. So property setting, put by property, put by ID, it's 2% and put by ID. Um, right, so it's probably, I'm thinking it's probably like um, setup code. So uh, the way the test the way most of the tests are structured, they're like, yeah, first you do some setup, and then you run the um, the main loop of the test, right? And I think in the A star test, they create a bunch of data structures and then traverse them with the A star algorithm. So if we look, let's see, go is the function that runs the test. Go does A star search. What is A star though? A star is um, this thing. So it starts by doing init, which does this. 
massive thing here. So passes in a grid. What is the grid? G1, G1 is, oh. G1 is a gigantic array literal, nested array literal. Of course. Okay, so there's a, like a whole bunch of that. Um, so we're passing that in and then iterating through it and adding more properties to each of these things. So we're adding FGH. Um, right. So I think probably what we're seeing here is like a whole bunch of that. Um, and probably some other stuff as well. But like this in particular is a bit problematic if we don't have the infrastructure to optimize right now because it's assigning new properties that were not there before like previously or initially we only have x y and is wall in each one of these little objects and then this code is adding like f g and h and parent so they're adding new properties that are not yet present on the object and because the objects are, they have the same shape. They all have the same shape because they have the same properties in the same order. Um, so we know how to cache each of these um, transitions in C++, but like that would be a whole big thing to do in machine code. And I think we need to make it a bit more streamlined in C++ before we think about making an assembly code fast path for it. Um, so something to get back to eventually, but like I don't really want to touch that one right now. And this is actually kind of nice. We're starting to see like time in the parser actually showing up in the top of the profile. You can see right here, script parse, 2.22%. Um, that's normally not the case for these benchmarks that we see the parsing time here so that really really cool and it's definitely stuff we should do to make the parser faster as well in fact if i'm to believe these numbers then we spend more time parsing than we do adding those properties can definitely make parsing faster i'm sure we're doing some complete nonsense in the parser array splicing as yeah, another one might be good to actually it's just a single call to erase splice which does has property and set hmm. that sounds slightly suspicious erase splice like do you really need both has property and set so this looks like it's just like a straight implementation from the spec algorithm. You can see all the spec comments in line here with all this stuff. Uh, Splice does all kinds of checks and then eventually it does a bunch of looping to remove and insert elements as needed. What are all these has property checks? Hmm. So if we have a property, then we get that property. So this kind of stuff, for example, although it's not in the spec, I think you can combine these two operations. I'm not sure if it will be observable though. It might... Yeah, that's something I would have to look into if it will actually be observable because we have to make sure that um, whenever you're doing anything differently from the spec, you have to make sure that the change is not observable in any way by a script. Um, so has property, same thing there. It's actually a whole bunch of these has property followed by get. And it seems to me like you should be able to bake those into a single operation because both of them will do a property lookup. And what if get does the property lookup and then just fails if you don't have the property, right? It seems like something you could combine. Anyway, I'm not going to start messing with that right now. So something to consider for the future. Um, JIT compiler itself could be faster as well, for sure. Um, we are definitely 
not using an optimal data structure for the output buffer of assembler. Um, in fact, we're using a vector, so it will like dynamically grow. So if you're building a large jitted code executable, uh, you might end up like resizing a vector multiple times as it grows. Kind of gross. Um, just under one percent of time spent in compile. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm kind of happy with. I guess I'm kind of happy with how far we got it already with these two changes, and maybe it's okay to let it go <laughs> for now. So, but it was still it's still good to to look at those things and um, and although we've made this test fast, there's a whole bunch of other tests that we haven't made fast. So there's lots of work to do. All the other benchmarks we have. Um, not just Kraken full of tests, but we also have Jetstream, Octane, and SunSpider, and Long Spider, which is SunSpider, just that the tests run longer for more iterations so that you get more of a chance to um, to do some hard work. But yeah, there's a whole bunch of tests between all these benchmarks, so we got stuff to work on. Uh, but this has been a great speed up on Kraken, so on crack an AIA star, let's say. So that's something to be happy about. I think our changes here are super simple and very tasteful. We should definitely implement the other equality related operators like loose equality, strict equality, and the inverse variance like for inequality. Um, we should do the fast paths for more than just object to object compare, like integer to integer. Um, null to null, undefined to undefined, stuff like that. Um, a whole bunch of things. But for now, to keep this simple, let's call that um, call that a day and end the video. So if you made it here, thank you for watching, for hanging out. I hope that you saw something interesting. I certainly enjoyed uh, seeing, um, seeing the, <laughs> the final performance score here. I think we are in very good shape on this particular test and um, it's time to find a new Kraken test to worry about. We'll see which one we pick um, or maybe something from Octane next time. We'll see, we'll see. But so far I'm really enjoying this JIT compiler stuff and it's been great making the videos. It's been really great. So many people have been joining in and working on it, um, adding optimizations and stuff. So really, really appreciate that. And um, let's do more stuff with it. It's because as I was saying on um, X, formerly known as Twitter, I think the ceiling is still far away in, in terms of like how fast we can go with this shit. There's a lot of stuff that we need to do before we are done with this architecture and can start worrying about um, if we need to make architectural changes to go faster. But um, for now, let's just um, keep adding fast paths and investigating, um, investigating the benchmarks that we're tracking. All right, end of the video. Thanks for hanging out. See you next time. Bye.